Good afternoon. Welcome to the Korea Society. I know most of you are uh, very familiar with the good work we do here, and we are very fortunate to have you here today for the beginning of what we're loosely calling Free Week, which is a week of programs around our gala, which happens to be tomorrow night at the plaza. Uh, we are beginning today with something that's very important that allows us to wear our heart on our sleeves, and that is to invite Joe McChristian to talk about the legacy of his grandfather, General James Van Fleet, who was the founder of Korea Society Incorporated in 1957 with a host of his close friends and mid-century luminaries, and I'll let Joe get to that. Uh, but it is important to us, I think, as we present the Van Fleet Award tomorrow night to an individual who uh, has made a significant contribution in the U.S.-Korea relationship uh, to maybe more uh, fully delve into the Van Fleet uh, legacy and contribution. And we're very honored to have Joe here today. I would invite you back uh, for the second program, which is next Monday at 2 o'clock. That will be a simulcast from Washington uh, looking at the recently... Uh, uh, finished uh, Seventh Party Congress in North Korea and the implications of what it may mean. And then next Wednesday at 3 p.m. on the 25th, we have uh, Ambassador Yi Chung Min here who will be presenting his new book, uh, Fault Lines in a Rising Asia, which is a tremendous read about the complexity of the challenges that we are facing across the region and its implication for those of us who are concerned about the U.S.-Korea relationship. Uh, Joe is up here. He's come up especially for this and for the gala. He is president of the newly formed Van Fleet uh, Foundation, and I'll let him talk to you about that. And he has just been a very wonderful friend and supporter of the Korea Society, uh, at least during my tenure and I know before, and uh, is always so enthusiastic. As you saw, he pre-presented here, uh, which doesn't often happen, uh, but that just shows you the, the wonderful uh, insight, the great humor, and the terrific spirit uh, that Joe brings to the podium, and uh, really his dedication to helping us understand the legacy of his grandfather, General James A. Van Fleet. Joe, welcome. Thank you very much. The enthusiasm is contagious here. So it's a pleasure. Thank you. It's a pleasure for me to be with you. And it's a pleasure for me to be here if I'm up here, especially if I'm back there and I have no responsibility, but I can enjoy everything that the Korea Society does. So thank you very, very much to all of you for letting me be here with you today and share some of my impressions of my grandfather and some of the things he did in his life and what made him a man who's a good example for others, but especially how he really had a great love for Korea and for the Korean people and how he devoted so much of his life to that. Now, I'm going to start back a ways where I'll remind people that he often said that he was proud and honored to be a living grandson of a man who fought in the Revolutionary War for our independence from Britain. It was in August of 1779 when the British hired a group of Mohawk Indians to go burn down a village of some Dutch settlers so that they would not join the British and fight, or join the Americans and fight against the British and terrorize them. Well, it backfired. The Van Fleet family home was burnt down and Joshua, Jan Van Vliet, not quite 15 years old, answered the call of Governor Clinton and joined the New York militia and fought for our independence. But they couldn't spell his name correctly then, so they anglicized it. And ever since then, it's been spelled the way we do now, Van Fleet. His father uh, had come from Holland in 1776, but his son, William, uh, was born in 1833, and was one of the early pioneers in the state of Florida. And he had good fortune and bad fortune, made several large fortunes and lost them due to ill timing. But his perseverance, and as grandfather said, his pluck and tenacity inspired grandfather's spirit of the will to win. And that's where he first ascribed having gotten that. Now, when he died at the age of 100, 
On September 23, 1992, General Van Fleet had served in the Army for 38 years. He'd been in five wars, in the Mexican border campaign chasing Pancho Villa in 1916, serving under Blackjack Pershing, all the way through the Korean War. And he had distinguished himself as a leader in combat at every level as a platoon leader, a company, battalion, regiment, division, corps, and army, every different level, all in combat. And then, for nearly 40 years after he left the Army, in 1953, he continued an extraordinary life in many, many walks of life that we can digress and go into at some time. But there are a lot of lessons that we can learn from him. Now, in World War II, his leadership was key to the Allied victory. And I know it's a great claim to make, but leading his regiment ashore on Utah Beach on D-Day was one of the first distinguished service crosses that he had received. But then he commanded the 90th Infantry Division during the Battle of the Bulge around Bastogne. And then at the Remagen Bridgehead, he took command of the Third Corps under General Patton and commanded that all the way through the end of the war until they got to the Austrian Alps. When General Omar Bradley was asked to describe Van Fleet's leadership, he replied, it was best described by the rate at which he earned distinguished service crosses, about three a day. Now, he had three total, not three a day, but the men under his command were earning them at that rate. Uh, that is the second highest award next to the Medal of Honor and that the American military has. So he had certainly done well in that regard. But General Patton, later when he was briefing a congressional delegation at his headquarters in Germany, said Van Fleet was the best of all combat generals who served under him. Coming from Patton, uh, that was quite a tribute. And then after the war, General Eisenhower called Van Fleet's battle record the best of any regimental division or corps commander we produced. Now, several years after World War II, on February 1st, 1948, General Van Fleet received secret orders directing him to report to General of the Army Dwight Eisenhower back in Washington. They'd been good friends for many years. They'd played football together. They'd been classmates at West Point, along with Omar Bradley. So when Van Fleet went back to Washington, he reported in. He expected that he might learn why Eisenhower wanted to see him. Eisenhower said, I'm sorry, I can't tell you, but Secretary Marshall is waiting to see you. So he was escorted over. Secretary George Marshall at the time was our Secretary of Defense and, had, and Secretary of State. And he had just returned from England where he had attended the wedding of Princess Elizabeth, the heir to the British throne, who was being married to uh, Prince Philip of Greece. Uh, when she was over there, she'd asked to speak to Secretary Marshall and told him that Greece very much appreciated the help that America and Britain were giving to the Greeks, especially the logistics support, but what they really needed was a general who knew how to win a war. And Queen Frederica asked, is there anything you can do to help us? So when Marshall went back, he relayed this to Eisenhower. That's why grandfather was called back to Washington. And he went in and Secretary Marshall explained this to him. And he said, Van Fleet, what can you do to help the Greeks? Van Fleet's answer was that if the Greeks have the will to win, and with our aid, Greece could be saved without the need of a single American rifleman. Marshall liked the answer and told Van Fleet to go to Greece, stopping in London on the way so, and coordinating with the British, so it would appear he came from both allies, but to find out, do the Greeks have the will to win? And he told him, while you're there, make sure that you make uh, good friendships with Queen Frederica and King Paul because they're dearly beloved by the Greek people. But also, I want you to report directly to me. 
uh, not through any other person. I leave it up to you to handle the diplomatic issues with the ambassador or whatever, but you will report only to me. Van Fleet got there not expecting all the media and the press to uh, bombard him with questions. He got out of Athens quickly, and he spent the first three weeks out in the field with all the online uh, troops of the National Greek Army. And he cabled back to Secretary Marshall that, yes, the Greeks do have the will to win. So Marshall said, fine, the job is yours. You stay there as head of the advisory group. Now, by the summer of, that was in 1948. By the summer of 1950, under General Van Fleet's guidance, the Greek military had defeated and driven the communists out of Greece. He was hailed as a national hero, and that's when the Greek people erected the marble statue of him. And I'm going to do, I'm going to digress one second because I skipped some of these pictures. That is the statue of him that was erected by the Greek people in northern Greece. There's other stories I can tell you about that one later. Less than a year after the end of the war in Greece, President Truman relieved General of the Army Douglas MacArthur in the Far East, replaced him with Matthew Ridgway, and sent Van Fleet to Korea to take command from General Ridgway and to command all of the U.S. ground forces in Korea, the ROC Army, and the ground forces of all the Allied UN forces in Korea at the time. He arrived in Korea on the 14th of April, 1951, eight days before the Chinese Communists launched their largest offensive of the war. With over 350,000 troops from four Chinese Army groups, together with another 25,000 men from the North Korean People's Army. Van Vliet led the U.S., Korean, and Allied Nations forces to victory in what remains the largest campaign waged by the U.S. Army since World War II. By late May, these enemy forces were falling back toward China in a rout. Korean President Syngman Rhee, General Van Fleet, Korean General Peck sun yup and U.S. Army Lieutenant General Edward Almond, who was commanding the 10th Corps at that time, and many of the other Allied leaders wanted to pursue the enemy all the way to the Yalu River and to unify Korea at that time. Victory was within our grasp. It could have been achieved. Imagine the world today if Korea had been unified as a free democratic country in June 1951. In the winter 2012 issue of Army History magazine, Robert Bruce, who's an associate professor of military history at the Marine Corps Command and Staff College, argues that the political aims of the Truman administration prevented Van Fleet's 8th Army from achieving a decisive military victory. Quote, in the opinion of Van Fleet, his military victories in Korea in April, May, and June 1951 were squandered, and victory in the Korean War was denied him and his 8th Army, not by an enemy in the field, but by a policy decision made by his own military and civilian superiors. In later years, Van Fleet would write and speak often what became a recurrent theme to him, the will to win. In Van Fleet's estimation, he had possessed the men and materiel necessary to end the Korean War with a resounding victory in June 1951. But Ridgway, the Truman administration, and the Joint Chiefs of Staff had lacked this will to win. It was a few years later, at a reception following the funeral of King Paul of Greece, when former President Harry Truman announced in a loud voice to those people around him, he said, you want to know about a great general? 
There's Van Fleet. I sent him to Greece and he won the war. And I sent him to Korea and he won the war. He's the greatest general we ever had. At that point, General Van Fleet, who was there at the dinner, politely but pointedly replied, well, actually, Mr. President, you never quite let me finish that last one. Shortly after his arrival in Korea, Van Fleet instituted a tremendous program of training and rebuilding the armed forces of the Republic of Korea. He helped the Koreans establish numerous military schools, even a war college, and most important of all for leadership, the Korean Military Academy, often referred to as the West Point of Korea. I'd like to digress a moment. There's a young man here today, Cadet Colin McCloy, class of 2017 from West Point. He is, he's General Van Fleet's great-great-grandson, carrying on our tradition. But last year, he made an exchange visit to Korea, to the Korea Military Academy. After we finish, if any of you wish to grill him with questions, maybe he can tell you about his experience. The Koreans refer this is a picture of the statue there at Korean Military Academy. The Koreans refer to him as the father of the Korean army, and they've erected this larger than life-size bronze statue of him at the Korean Military Academy. And to this day, his name is still revered in Korea, and his memory continues to inspire leaders of the future. I have met many Korean officers over the last several years, who are graduates of KMA. And every single one I've met has told me how when they were cadets and they would look out the window of their barracks or they would be there on the grounds of the academy and they would see his statue, it served as an inspiration to them. I'm happy to hear that. I grew up loving the man as my grandfather. I never really appreciated all the things he did, but I'm happy to hear that he had that influence on so many outstanding leaders in Korea today. After the Korean War, President Eisenhower asked General Van Fleet to accept the post of U.S. Ambassador to Korea. Van Fleet respectfully declined this request from his old friend, explaining that he did not agree with the Eisenhower's administration's policies with regard to Korea and he could not use his influence with President Sigmund Rhee to advocate those policies. General Van Fleet had a great love for Korea and the Korean people, and he often spoke about Korea as his second home. For nearly, uh, for nearly 40 years after the Korean War, he devoted much of his life to promoting foreign investment in Korea and to strengthening all aspects of the relationships, friendships, and bonds between the United States and the Republic of Korea. Standing on the steps of the Capitol building in Seoul on the morning of the 29th of January, 1953, he spoke to the people of Seoul. For him, the time of his departure from Korea was a very sad occasion in his life. His only wish was that he could have done more for Seoul and more for Korea and for the fighting forces of the Republic of Korea. He said to the people of Korea, quote, I shall come back. You have made me a part of you. I know you are a part of me. I shall not ask you to give me back my heart. I leave it with you. On the 20th of November, 1957, General Van Fleet was one of the five signers of the Certificate of Incorporation of the Korea Society, establishing it as a New York corporation for the following purpose. The purpose was to further and continue the friendly relationship that has long existed between the American people and the people of Korea through mutual understanding and appreciation 
of their respective cultures, aims, ideals, arts, sciences, and industries to the end that their peoples may, through an ever closer cooperation, continue their contribution to the improvement of mankind. Let it never be said that the Korea Society started out with a limited vision. I'm thrilled to see the purpose that they had when they started and, and continue. With support from an outstanding board of directors, and these are the names of the 16 original directors. We can go back to that if anyone wishes, but they were prominent leaders in America, in business, in media, in academia, in the military, many walks of life. And these are the five men who signed the Certificate of Incorporation. Uh, Spiro Skouras, who was the head of 20th Century Fox, Charles Auchincloss, who was a prominent attorney. Uh, William Zeckendorf, one of the largest real estate developers in New York. Ben Lim, who had been Korea's foreign minister and also served as the a United Nations representative from the Republic of Korea. And then my grandfather. Those were the five men who signed as the founders of the Korea Society. But with support from these men, Congratulations and encouragement, both from President Dwight Eisenhower and also from President Syngman Rhee, and then with General Van Fleet as its first president, the Korea Society was off to a good start. But for nearly 60 years, it has been providing exemplary service to the peoples of both countries. Next year, we're approaching the 60th anniversary and one of the projects that I'm hoping to be able to do, I'm trying to reach out to the grandchildren of those original directors that you saw. I've spoken to the two grandsons of William Zeckendorf, and I've spoken to the two grandsons and granddaughter of Spiro Skouras. I'm trying to reach out to all the others to see if we can't gather together a group of my generation to help publicize the wonderful things Korea Society has been doing for the last 60 years and to help rekindle broad public support for this wonderful organization. In May of 1962, General Van Fleet visited Korea with a delegation of American businessmen coming invited to Korea by General Park Chung-hee. Upon his return on the 1st of June, 1962, he spoke at a meeting of the Los Angeles World Affairs Council. He titled his remarks, The Miracle on the Han. And he concluded that speech by saying, I have been to Korea many times, each time agreeably surprised by the hardworking, skilled, and intelligent labor force. This time, I found it well-organized and dedicated. The military government has brought about security, stability, progress, and a moral rebirth. This is what I call the miracle on the Han. Yes, it is the most exciting nation in Asia. Here, the know-how, hard work, dedication, organization, and management can build anything that is being built in Japan, in Italy, in Germany, or even in the United States, and export it at a price that will be competitive worldwide. On my recent trip, in all that I have seen, wherever I have gone, I have found a fresh spirit of progress and optimism in the land. I shall not soon forget the beauty of their mountains, and their valleys, the smiles and voices of their children, the hospitality and warmth of their homes. It is my other home, and I shall go back. Throughout his life, General Van Fleet inspired others with the will to win by his daily example and through his writings and speeches. On the 10th of May, 1976, at the U.S. Army War College, 
he addressed the students and faculty in a speech entitled Operation Win. And quote, most of you officers, if not all, have served your country on the battlefields of Korea and Vietnam, maybe in World War II and Greece. You know there are no second place winners. Surely we all experienced full measure our country's agonies at a time when the will to win on the home front and elsewhere disintegrated. Liberty cannot endure without leaders imbued with the will to win and the ability to influence and inspire others with the will to win. Yes, you must instill that ideal in your subordinates and encourage it in your superiors, your people, and your government. When our national will is weak, it impairs our alliances and encourages all forms of aggression. But when our will is strong and resolute, we improve our alliances and discourage aggressors. Now today, as we enjoy the fruits of his labors and listen to the wisdom of his words, we can ask ourselves, how did he do it? What can we learn about the character and the personality of the man and about his leadership style that might inspire others to follow his example? The Washington Post captured some of it in an article published on April 28, 1951 two weeks after he arrived in Korea. And the headline was Van Fleet's Inspiration. And I quote, Courage, faith, humility, these are the qualities that stand out in General Van Fleet's first message to his troops. In simple language, the new commander of the 8th Army in Korea has brought encouragement to his soldiers in the face of the Chinese onslaught. He has done more, however, than praise the skill and determination of the United Nations forces and cite their superiority in all but numbers. With a directness which gains additional eloquence by the fact that it comes from the battlefield, he has summarized the larger issues in the fighting. He said, You are fighting to stop armed aggression and maintain peace not only in Korea, but in your respective homelands. This renewed battle is for the preservation of life, liberty, and the right to the pursuit of happiness of all free men. These are fundamental in the rights of man, the rock upon which our civilization is founded, and they are the first rights which communism denies its own people. The time has come when all men of the free and decent world must steal their souls to face the desperate, bitter, bitter, and uncompromising battle with armed communist aggression. Our strength rests on the solid foundation of belief in God and the rights of man rather than on the will of dictators imposed through cruelty and complete disregard of human rights. The Washington Post continued saying, even in the grimness of war, these words are inspiring to those who hear them. The more so because, as the troops must know, they spring from a deeply religious nature. They tell a lot about the character of a man who uttered them, and they carry a conviction born of fighting experience and spiritual toughness, which must show to the soldiers in Korea that their commander has the qualities of leadership. Now, General Van Fleet was a charismatic leader. He exuded confidence, competence, courage, and conviction. But he was a humble man who was proud to say of himself, I'm a soldier. Of all the honors and awards that he had ever received, his most precious was his combat infantryman's badge. On September 24th, the day after his death in 1992, the New York Times wrote, throughout his career, the tall, blue-eyed, four-star general had a reputation 
for caring for and respecting even the privates in his command. I never want to command by fear, he once said. I never want to be accused of abuse of power. Power is given to you to exercise in a kindly way. When asked once how we won the war in Greece, he said, it was we the team that made victory possible. Drawing an analogy with football, he saw himself as the coach, sent by President Truman with a directive embodying real authority and grave responsibility. The team members included a united, stable Greek government, effective leader of the quarterback, the field marshal Alexander Papagos, aggressive generals, superb soldiers, a competent staff of loyal and qualified Greek, British, and American staff officers. But in support were all the people of Greece, inspired by their beloved King Paul and Queen Frederica, who furnished the unity and morale to fight on to victory. Each individual was important to the team's success. This principle of the importance General Van Fleet placed on each individual on the team was recalled a few years ago during a business meeting in Korea. A group of senior executives from a large U.S. corporation was negotiating a venture with one of the largest Korean industrial conglomerates. When the chairman of the Korean company learned that the senior U.S. executive had known General Van Fleet, the chairman stopped the meeting to tell a story. During the Korean War, he had been a young soldier, part of an honor guard welcoming General Van Fleet to his unit's headquarters. As General Van Fleet was approaching the entrance, he stopped, he turned, and he walked straight to the young soldier, and he placed his hand on the sh soldier's shoulder, which I've been told in Korea is not appreciated to go and touch someone in that manner. But he walked up to this young soldier and put his hand on his shoulder like he would have to me, and he said, what is your function? Van Fleet then said, if you understand your function in this unit, then the unit will be successful. The chairman then concluded his story by saying that this principle had guided him his entire life from that moment with General Van Fleet and that it was the main reason for the success of his corporation. Now, General Van Fleet preserved the records of his life and experiences for posterity in his personal archives. In 1989, he donated them to the George Marshall Foundation, which is located on the campus of the Virginia Military Institute in Lexington, Virginia. The Van Fleet collection of correspondence, of photographs, and memorabilia, and other items occupies more than 65 linear feet of shelf space in the basement vaults at the Marshall Foundation making it one of the largest collections in their archives. The Van Fleet Foundation is now working with the Marshall Foundation to digitize General Van Fleet's archives in order to make them available freely over the internet to the entire world. Today, General Van Fleet continues to receive awards and honors as his contributions and legacy are remembered. This was a Korean delegation in 2013 going to Arlington National Cemetery for a wreath laying. I was honored that they asked me to join them next to General Peck Sun Yup. Ambassador Ahn is there, and the uh, Korean presidential delegate Kim Jong un next to the ambassador. Uh, they had gone to lay wreaths there and at General Walker's grave, and at General Ridgeway's grave, all at Arlington Cemetery. In June 2015, the Republic of Korea issued a postage stamp honoring General Van Fleet as a hero of the Korean War. There's a little presentation folder sitting up here you may wish to look at later with some of the stamps and that was given to me by the Minister of Patriots and Veterans Affairs at the ceremony in 
So this past year in the fall, the Ministry of Defense of the Republic of Korea awarded him the Peck Sunyup Rock U.S. Alliance Award. The certificates for that are over on the other table along with the medal that was presented to me at that time on his behalf. I went there to represent him. He was a winner. This is a picture of him at his 100th birthday party. And he saw approaching him across the yard two American soldiers wearing the Medal of Honor. And the very first thing he could do was immediately salute. No matter what your rank is, you salute any soldier wearing the Medal of Honor. And to be sure he held a straight salute, I can see him hold his left hand up to keep it straight. But the look of pride on his face and appreciation that they were there with him. He had amazing stamina. His enthusiasm was contagious. He made those around him feel that he was thrilled that we were there with him. And he also made us feel that with him, we were winners as well. His example continues to inspire in us the will to win. I'd be more than happy to take any questions or talk about any of this. I hope I haven't wrote, used too much of your time, ladies and gentlemen, but uh, every one of these things we can digress. So thank you. We're very grateful to Joe for taking the time, especially in advance of the gala. And this really was very interesting. And we're delighted to have this for electronic distribution. And you can see these in all our programs uh, through koreasociety.org. On the Truman question, I would also refer you to a program we did uh, early last spring, which was with uh, Rudd Potts, uh, Rutherford Potts, who was the AP uh, bureau chief from Tokyo who covered the war. And uh, that was the first uh, sort of comprehensive uh, history or reporter's account of the war he deals with this question throughout the book. It was uh, published in 1954, and it's a fascinating discussion here on stage. Uh, we will have Joe's program up, and I hope that you can look at it again, either through video or audio podcast. But we wanted to give Joe a special gift, uh, which we hope the audience will appreciate, and it requires a little explanation on Joe's part uh, beyond what I do, uh, which is uh, we wanted to present Joe with something very different than what we normally present our speakers, which is a, ah. a very large tub of uh, salt seat car uh, ice cream on which he can put marshmallows, and uh, I will let Joe. Yeah, I will let Joe explain why a large tub of ice cream is important in the Van Fleet legacy. <laughs> so go ahead and explain why, why why that has significance. My grandfather loved ice cream, to put it simply, but uh, anywhere he would go, he would make sure that there were the ability to make ice cream even out in the field for the troops. Uh, but I remember one time in Florida, my grandfather, my mother, and dad were in the car, and they were traveling across the state of Florida, and they passed the Howard Johnson's, back in those days, the famous Howard Johnson had 28 flavors of ice cream, and they made some very good ice cream. And grandfather wants a pint of ice cream. So he pulled the car over, and said he'd buy for everybody. What did you want? Well, he got Rocky Road, I think, and put his mother got pistachio, whatever. But grandfather wanted a pint of ice cream. Mother went in and bought the ice cream, came back, and grandfather finished his pint. He looked over, mother was still eating. He said, <laughs> What happened? She had a quart, not a pint. <laughs> he said, oh, Wait a minute. How is it you got a quart and I only got a pint? <laughs> He, he loved ice cream, so Steve remembered that this this will not go to waste. It will be eaten before it melts. Enjoy your court. Thank, Thank you. you. Ladies and gentlemen, Joe McChristian. Thank, Thank you. you very much.